Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, former Education Secretary William Bennett discusses his new book, A Century Turns, New Hopes, New Fears. The book provides a historical look at U.S. politics and culture at the end of the 20th century and the start of a new millennium. The nationally syndicated radio talk show host begins with the 1988 presidential election and takes the reader through 20 years of memorable events and cultural changes, concluding with the election of Barack Obama. He discusses this turn of the century with Aspen Institute President Walter Isaacson. Hello, it's my pleasure to be here with Bill Bennett, an old friend, somebody who's written now a third in a trilogy of history books. There were two great volumes you did uh, on American history uh, that ended in 1989, and now you're doing a slightly slimmer volume to continue it to the present. Is that, uh, you see it as part of a trilogy? It is part of a trilogy. The book is a century turns, but it is the third in a series, America, the Last Best Hope. The reason, I was a little reluctant. Uh, you know, you've written history books. Uh, this history is pretty close to us, and so I was worried about perspective, objectivity. But um, because America Last Best Hope, the first two volumes are now in the schools, are available mm -hmm. in the public schools, teachers like to believe they're going to get up to the present. I say that because mm -hmm. usually they don't make right. it, but they like to believe they're going to get their students up to the present. So they asked me to do it. America uh, Last Best Hope in some ways tried to, uh, in your mind, write the way we teach history a little bit from, uh, I think you felt there was what you might call a leftist or a bias or a bias that didn't really glorify the triumphs of uh, American exceptionalism. Is that about right? I'd say this. I think the biggest problem, Walter, that I have with most of the history books mm -hmm. out there, or now as they're called social studies books, mm -hmm. is that they're boring. Mm -hmm. and and they put kids to sleep. And this is very odd because, as you know, books about history, American history, historical figures sell very well. You've written a couple of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Your Franklin book is a great book. Uh, David McCullough's books always sell, books, uh, biographies of Hamilton. So why do we kill students with this stuff, you know, in the, in the grades? This is our worst subject, by the way. So my, my major argument was that uh, they were boring. But, yes, yeah, sometimes politically tendentious, usually to the left. But, hey, give, give me some examples uh, that you felt was wrong in the way we taught American history. Well, I remember, I can't remember the book, but the most famous example was when uh, I was Secretary of Education. I remember I read, a, I was in New Orleans actually visiting a school, and we came across a sentence in the book that they were using, and it talked about the Puritans as Englishmen who took long trips in search of new places to, to live. They, didn't want to, they wouldn't want to put the religion, no religion part in because that would violate it, yeah. the First Amendment. But other books, Howard Zinn, who was a colleague of mine at Boston oh. University, is an enormously successful book, and it's got some great scholarship in it. But The People's History of the American Republic is a politically tendentious book. It, it leans left. He's pretty explicit about it, self-avowed about it, and uh, says this is his perspective and point of view. You would pr be pretty depressed about America if that was the only book you read. You got your doctorate from the University of Texas right. in philosophy, actually. Uh, nowadays, Texas is engaged in a bit of a struggle over new textbooks for history and how to teach civics and history better. What do you think of the school boards, or I guess it's a state school, uh, school board, uh, trying to dictate uh, new types of uh, uh, standards for our civics text. Well, I think the debate is fine. The Texas thing is larger than Texas mm -hmm. because Texas sells so many textbooks. Mm -hmm. What happens there echoes, echoes around the country. Many of the debates are worthwhile. I think some of the stuff is silly. Uh, what you should do is teach the truth, teach mm -hmm. what happened, talk about the people who mattered to American history. You know, you shouldn't leave out the Liberty Bell and you shouldn't leave out the Alamo. And when there are two important sides to the story to tell, you should tell the two important sides to the story. Um, there's a kind of reductionism, I find, in a lot of the journalistic accounts of these debates that make them seem very simple-minded. I always, before I enter into the debates, particularly this one, try to find out from the people what they actually said, mm -hmm. and it's usually different from what's reported. This may come as a shock to <laughs> Real people, shock to but you, you would know yeah, this, right. you would know this business. But I think these debates are fine. Look, the education of our children. Plato said the two most important questions. Who gets to teach the children and what do we teach them? So have at it. 
Well, you know, it, to me, it's not only fine, it's glorious when people are arguing how come Woodrow Wilson gets more than uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, who was a better president, and arguing over Woodrow Wilson versus Ronald Reagan, who uh, shaped the republic more, is great, whichever side you come down on, it would Ab seem to me. Absolutely, no, these are great debates. And now it's interesting that where people, everyone's, everyone invokes the founders, of course. Mm -hmm. The left invokes founders, the right invokes the founders. I, I just would like people to read the founders. You know, right. in, in almost invocations, read the Federalist Papers. They're really, really worth reading. Speaking of invoking the founders, particularly they're invoked by those on religious sides of the argument. How do you see that debate? In, in, in what sense? Well, people are invoking the founders as saying we're a Christian nation. That's in the Texas issue as well. Well, I don't think there's any question that the people who wrote these documents uh, were writing out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And again, if you read the Federalist Papers, mm -hmm. this, is, this is what all the references are. It's pretty hard to, you know, understand a phrase like we hold these truths to be self-evident and all men are created equal, uh, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. The, the key, I think, is to understand that although most of these men came from a certain perspective and religious background and orientation, we established the first really sensible way of dealing with these issues in a large and open society. Think of Washington's letter to the Hebrew congregation. In this yeah. country, we shall all sit and none will be afraid. Yeah, in fact, even that sentence in the Declaration of Independence that you cited, there's a wonderful scene of the three great drafters of the Declaration, Franklin, Adams, and Jefferson, doing it. And Jefferson's first draft of that sentence had, they're endowed with certain inalienable rights. And it was Adams who wrote in, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And then um, Jefferson had, we hold these shoes to be sacred. And Franklin wrote in, we hold these truths to be self-evident. So they're doing a careful balance there, you know, almost a, a deistic balance where they make reference to a creator, but not necessarily to a Christian God or any particular God. Uh, fair enough. But I, I, I think, you know, when I was reviewing a lot of the textbooks mm -hmm. uh, in pre preparation writing mine, I noticed that they tried to, several of them seemed to try to expunge any reference to God, to Christianity, mm. to the history of Christianity, Judeo-Christian traditions. I like uh, Edward Corwin's essay, you remember the great professor mm. at Princeton, The Higher Law Background of, of American Constitutional Law. It's a great sentence in there. He said, um, religious liberties are the, are the residuary legatee of ecclesiastical animosities. These <laughs> things were fought out in churches. Uh, was people, why they, uh, the Puritans became such good travelers, that, as you exactly, said, as they exactly were fighting right. out that's in the right. church is the whole notion of uh, the why theology. They took long trips. But look, this is a great topic um, for a debate right. in, a, in a school board. It's a great topic for discussion in a classroom, mm -hmm. as well as before the Supreme Court. But I would say, and you know I am partial to America here and the mm -hmm. idea of American exceptionalism, is that we have pretty much, we've had our struggles, but we have pretty much worked this out about as well as any country has. But the way we worked it out, it seems, is that the founders gave to America one of the greatest gifts that was very unusual then, especially for our well-traveled Puritan uh, founders, which was a good-natured religious tolerance, that even if you were the Mufti of Constantinople, you'd get to preach in Philadelphia. And in some ways, these debates seem to downplay this notion of tolerance, instead try to uh, push a more religious uh, view of America's founding, or am I incorrect there? I, I don't see it. I mean, I hear it. I hear the, I hear the charge, but I don't see it. Um, I spend a lot of time in the homeschool community. I spend a lot of time in the conservative community. I hear the claims of bigotry. I, I saw more bigotry myself uh, when I was at Harvard uh, than I saw when I was in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. I saw more intolerance toward Southern Christian uh, young people than I saw uh, people in the South being intolerant of people who had no faith or other faith. Um, it is more complicated now, and I don't know if you want to get into this, but it's more complicated now because of Islam uh, and because of 9-11 mm -hmm. and because, frankly, it is harder, it is harder to support the notion of an Islamic faith and an Islamic religion which will condemn these acts of violence when we see so few uh, professions by uh, Islamic leaders and spokesmen uh, on this issue. 